Hello everybody and welcome to this week's, uh, one of this week's lectures. We're going to talk today about the 18th and 19th centuries. And I always like to start thinking about uh, modes of display in the 18th and 19th century because modes of display at this point in history are very different, were very different than they are today. So for instance we had what we call salons and these were gathering places uh, and oftentimes uh, salons were hosted by aristocratic hostesses um, and this was one way for them to kind of revel in social status, show off their social status and kind of compare their status to those of others. Here's a, a painting of um, a salon show. So you can see it's very different uh, than what we see today and I'll, I'll get to a picture of what a, a modern gallery looks like today. But here you see the basically the higher classes, the aristocrats, and then you also have uh, the display of the paintings. And so as you can see, there's smaller paintings closer to the floor, uh, closer to the uh, ground level, and then as you go up, the paintings get bigger. And we'll also talk in a second about how the uh, subject matter changes as well. But basically, these places, these salons, were very different than the, uh, a modern uh, gallery. For instance, they included oftentimes not just uh, exhibitions of art, but also music was very prominent in these spaces. These were spaces of interaction, noise, movement, conversation, and debate. That is to say that uh, people would uh, engage in uh, debates about paintings. You know, you'd come to these spaces and basically um, test each other in some ways uh, intellectually on uh, a certain painting or perhaps an historical event that is represented in a painting. So basically there would be lots of conversation happening, lots of movement around the space, lots of interaction. And as I said, this was basically an activity just for the aristocratic classes. Um, I also wanted to note, and you can see it better in this uh, painting, but there's a couple different classes of paintings that you see oftentimes uh, selected to be displayed at the salon. Um, down here on the bottom, close to the floor, this is where we often see uh, either genre painting or um, portraiture or still lifes. So I think we've talked about still life before, so that's basically like if you have uh, a table with a plate and a wine glass and an apple in front of you and then you just paint that. So that's like a still life. It's basically uh, creating a still image from life. So those would be on the bottom rows here, and then as we work up, you'll see um, um, sometimes kind of uh, paintings um, that have to do with perhaps more wealthy donors. Uh, and moving all the way up here, you'll see what we call history paintings and oftentimes religious paintings. So the tops of the gallery spaces were oftentimes reserved for religious and uh, history paintings. Uh, and when I say history paintings, I mean paintings of historical events, uh, these also have to do with biblical events, and oftentimes these paintings were much bigger, uh, which was also the reason they were put on top, uh, up towards the ceiling, because people could uh, see them much more easily that way. And as you can see, the paintings are really stacked in there, as close as they can be, and uh, if you'll recall, this is very different than what we have today. So think in your mind, what do you have today? What uh, what do galleries look like? They kind of look like this, right? So this is kind of your your modern contemporary gallery space. Um, this is what we call the white cube aesthetic. So it's basically uh, the whitening of the gallery space, right? We have all white walls, fluorescent lights here. It's basically a cube, right? There's nothing else in the space except for the art. And we have cement floors, it's oftentimes highly air-conditioned, kind of a cold space. And we're often told to be quiet in spaces like this, right? There's not going to be music. Uh, it's very unlikely that you're able to have food in these spaces. Actually, in most galleries, you aren't allowed to have pens, only pencils. Um, just in case there's that crazy person out there who's going to take out their pen and, you know, draw on one of the paintings. Uh, but this is basically what you see today, which is very different than these early gallery spaces called salons that we saw uh, coming about in the, in the 18th and 19th centuries. 
So we're going to talk about a variety of styles today. We're going to start with Rococo. This was an important style that came about during uh, the 18th century, in the mid-18th century. Rococo was a term that was derived from, it basically means small decorative stones and shells. Um, and you can see here that um, paintings like this were really influenced um, kind of by the, uh, the style um, that we see here at Versailles. And this is a, a great palace uh, just outside of Paris. That was the palace of King Louis XV, uh, the king who ruled right before the French Revolution. And as you can see, it's not a modest space. It was certainly a space of, of decoration, self-indulgence, glitter and glam, right? We have these amazing chandeliers. This is called the Hall of Mirrors. And you can see here today, it's uh, basically turned into um, a museum. So people who are... This is, it's full of tourists. So going back to our painting here, the Rococo period is actually kind of right at the end of the Baroque period, so sometimes people will call it late Baroque. But it's important to note that it's also a reaction against the kind of grandeur, symmetry, and strict re regulations of the Baroque era and the Baroque style. So recall, and we'll look at a Baroque painting in just a second for uh, reference, but recall the high contrasts of the Baroque, the very kind of serious subject matter. And here instead you have something that's completely different. Here you have an interest in uh, these three F words. And I had a professor in undergrad who, uh, when he would talk about the Rococo, he'd talk about these three F words, and he'd of course say, well, it's not what you think it is. It's floral, it's fanciful, and it's frivolous, okay? This was the style of the aristocracy. So these are um, the higher classes, the people in the upper classes who just want to have fun, right? These are people who don't necessarily have, uh, you know, they just kind of have um, some sort of running income. They don't have, they're not the working class, right? Uh, they have a lot of free time, so they have a lot of time to uh, hang out with friends, uh, bathe with one another. Here's an image of kind of a fun bath happening between probably goddesses. Um, but basically, these paintings are really interested in the fanciful. You see a lot of fancy kind of dress and garb. You see a lot of floral uh, scenes of nature. And then, of course, you'll always find these paintings have everything to do with uh, the frivolous, right? fun, um, having, everyone's having kind of a good time. And this, as I've said, was in uh, direct contrast to the earlier Baroque period, where we have, in fact, very serious subject matter. This is a biblical scene, right? This is almost, could be a biblical history story. Um, so it's the calling of St. Matthew. We have Christ here who points his finger at St. Matthew. Um, that the beam of light comes in, right, high contrast, we've got very serious subject matter happening here, kind of very strict regulations, um, and uh, real interest in realism. But rather, in the, in the uh, Rococo period, we are moving away from that. And here's one of my favorite paintings in the Rococo period. Um, Watteau is the artist here, French artist, and this is called The Pilgrimage on the Isle of Cythera. And this has everything to do with the Rococo style. As you can see, there's a more interest in the flowing kind of painterly brush strokes here, um, far away from this kind of uh, rigidity in the Baroque style. But you also have an interest in flora, and you have an interest in fun. Uh, it's very fanciful, right? And we also have uh, in an interest in the frivolous. So basically, this whole painting is about love, and how the uh, aristocracy has the time to engage in love and courting one another, and that's basically what's happening here. The island of Cythera is basically uh, supposed to be a mythical island associated with uh, the goddess of love, and it's called Cythera. And so they're either leaving the island, here's a symbol of love here, we have um, the goddess of love depicted here, or it's possible that they're actually getting onto this boat down here heading off to the island of Cythera. But you can see here, if you look closely at the figures, they each kind of are courting one another. Um, as we get closer to the boat, the couples, the couples become closer and closer to one another. So they're about to go onto the boat, and then we have a series of kind of puti, or otherwise known as cupids, who are working here to kind of allow, to help people to fall in love. So this is all about the aristocratic uh, 
class, having the time, taking the weekend to go and uh, find love on this mythical island. It's all about kind of the fun and the frivolous. And we also see that in the, the painting The Swing by Fragonard. Uh, notice Fragonard was also the painter who painted the bathers that we looked at earlier. So what is, uh, what is very Rococo about this? Well, here again you have an interest in the floral and also the kind of uh, uh, lifestyles of the rich and famous. So the lifestyles of the aristocracy. This woman has a very fancy dress, right? These men are dressed very nicely. She swings here. This man seems to be uh, swinging, pushing her forward. And then if you look here, she kicks her shoe off and she gazes down at this male figure. Obviously, they're courting one another. They're having fun. And then he just happens to be, uh, his line of sight goes straight right up her dress, right? And so it's all sorts of kind of fun and frivolous kind of activities happening here. Very uh, signature Rococo style. Moving on, uh, the other style that we're going to talk about within this lecture is called neoclassicism. Neoclassicism... Uh, was basically uh, began uh, after the unearthing of Herculaneum and Pompeii. And we've talked about Pompeii in this class before. Remember, it's an ancient Roman city um, that was covered up by a volcano um, before the, I think it was in the 90 or something, uh, before the Common Era. So it was like 2,000, at least 2,000 years before it was uncovered. So it was covered with a volcanic ash for about 2,000 years. You can see an image of it over here at the right, and then the volcano Mount Vesuvius in the background. Uh, so basically in 1748, right at the time that we're talking about right now, in the mid-18th century, um, um, excavators found the site and unearthed this amazing ancient Roman uh, site. So uh, because of these ancient sites that were unearthed, this um, uh, contributes to an, a renewed interest in the classical past. And so this is where neoclassicism comes from, and it basically replaces the self-indulgence of the Rococo style. So it's Napoleon and his army that invades Italy and ends up bringing back a series of classical sculptures. You can see a portrait of Napoleon here. Um, so basically, he uses neoclassical art to legitimize his empire. And, and you see this often where kings always are trying, or kings are always trying to relate their rule with that of the ancient Roman emperors. And so this is uh, also what happened here with uh, Napoleon. Uh, he basically wanted to legitimize his empire by um, relating it to that of ancient Rome. So, uh, there, you know, his army went to Rome and invaded Italy, uh, invaded Rome, and uh, brought back lots of classical sculpture. And these were the models for important um, key pieces of architecture that came out around his rule, including the Church of La Madeleine and the Arc de Triomphe, which uh, some of you might have already known about. And look at just how ancient uh, these uh, pieces of art architecture look, but they're actually from the mid 17th century or the mid 18th century. All right, so um, what is the neoclassical? Like, like I said, it draws uh, from inspiration from the classical art and cultures of ancient Greece and ancient Rome. Um, and this is also at a time where we have the Age of the Enlightenment. So this is from 1685 to 1815. Um, this is at a time where we have a renewed interest not only in the classical past, but also on reason as a primary source of authority and legitimacy. So rather than thinking um, so much about the, uh, the, the sacred world, right, and thinking about, you know, uh, God is the reason why everything in the world happens, people were much more interested in reason, right, and reason as being the, the, um, uh, the kind of source of knowledge, okay. So um, advanced ideals such as liberty and progress and tolerance were also very important at this time, and um, this is happening in the economic sphere, uh, in science, uh, most definitely, but it's also happening 
politically and also in the art world. So in the art world, you see a renewed interest in order, harmony, and moral perfection. And of course, this is right in line with neoclassical ordeals. Or ideals. Whoops. And so Jacques-Louis David is one of these re really important artists who was a neoclassical painter. Uh, he's active in the, um, in the French Revolution. He was an active artist at the time, and he was really interested in the kind of the politics of the French Revolution. Um, so he did paintings like this that were really important at that time. Um, this is a portrait of a French po a political theorist, physician, and scientist. His name was Marat. Um, he was known for his role as a radical journalist during the political uh, revolution, during the French Revolution, and he was actually uh, murdered. Uh, he actually had a, a rare skin disease uh, that made it very difficult for him, so every night he had to take a bath, um, and he had to basically soak him, his body in, in water every evening um, to make himself comfortable because of the skin disease. So here is one evening when he was taking his bath, and this is a true story, uh, and then someone came in and murdered him in his bath. And he was actually writing, uh, he was actually uh, writing, because he was a journalist, about the French Revolution at the time when he was killed. And so here's this amazing painting, uh, a tribute to him by Jacques-Louis David, um, where he uh, actually associates him with being a martyr for the cause. And so he actually associates him with the death of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ as the ultimate kind of martyr. Um, so you can see here, uh, the, here's David's painting and then uh, the, the deposition, um, an important uh, piece by uh, van der Weyden. And then uh, we also have another deposition piece, a Baroque piece uh, by Caravaggio. And both of these uh, show the figure kind of in a similar fashion as we see uh, Marat. And here we have another painting by David. This is called The Oath of the Harashai. We're actually going to skip over this for the sake of time. I don't want this lecture to go too long. Um, but here again, we have a real interest in the classical past. We have an interest in morality. Uh, be sure to read about this in your book. It's a, an amazing painting. And I also posted a video about this painting. But it has everything to do with morality. It's an ancient Roman story that is renewed in the class uh, neoclassical period. Um, that has very much to do with kind of contemporary events that are happening at the time that when David is painting. And now we'll move on to a movement called Romanticism. Romanticism asserted that reality was actually a function of an individual's point of view. So in other words, there is an emphasis on emotion and individualism, as well as the glorification of the awe of nature. And that's really what we'll see emphasized in the paintings I'm going to look at today, is this interest in nature. And so you see here uh, that Friedrich, an important romanticist at the time, is exploring kind of this idea of nature as overcoming or uh, overbearing, uh, something that we have no control over, right? This beautiful expanse in front of this man who kind of stands here and ponders um, about the kind of grandeur of nature. And this is very much in the in the as a reaction to the Industrial Revolution, which is happening at the time. So cities are getting bigger and bigger, uh, and people are kind of losing their uh, losing touch with nature. Okay, um, and this also has much to do with the aristocratic social and political norms of the age of the Enlightenment. And there's also an interest here in scientific rationalization of nature. Okay. So, as I said, um, um, especially Friedrich here is interested in nature as something that is uncontrollable, right? It has this power that is in many ways unpredictable. Um, and there's a, it has a potential for all sorts of kind of extremes. Um, here down in South Texas, we know the, uh, the extreme of uh, extreme heats, right? Um, but this, in so many ways, offered an alternative uh, to the kind of ordered world of the Enlightenment, Right, which was very interested in science, everything scientific, and rather here these artists were interested in kind of this grand, uh, uncontrollable, unpredictable thing, which is nature itself. I'm going to actually skip past Turner's paintings as well. 
um, just to keep the lecture shorter, but I, I uh, encourage you to look at his uh, paintings, uh, which I think are in his in the book as well. He's another in uh, artist interested in romanticism and especially the grandeur of nature. You can see this amazing nature scene here, a waterfall, and then look just how tiny the figure is. And there's a figure with a little tiny dog. And these figures are completely dwarfed uh, by kind of the grandeur of nature. And here's another one similar to it, uh, another one by Friedrich, where you see the same type, of set, same type of thing happening. And here I'd like to introduce the word sublime. So basically sublime, in other, in other words, means not just the band, uh, but it's also the philosophical, it's a philosophical term that is often used at this time in history to talk about kind of the greatness that is beyond all possibility of calculation, measure, and imitation. And so, of course, this is a definition that has everything to do with nature at this time. So these artists are completely interested in the sublime. And lastly, I want to talk about realism. So uh, Gustave Courbet is a French artist who uh, was dedicated to representing reality and confining his work uh, to basically only two subjects in daily life. Here you see the stone breakers. And here's another important um, another important painting by the same artist. Um, this painting was actually rejected from the Universal Exposition, which was an important show in 1855, because um, its jurors thought that the tone was too monotonous, and they thought it showed people who were just too ordinary. So look, uh, if we think about realism, right, these are just two people who are breaking stones. These are guys who are working on their daily job, um, um, and they're literally just breaking stones. This is something they did every day. It's very much in interested in the daily life of people, right, real people, which is a complete rejection of this kind of interest in nature, the sublime, uh, things that are completely unpredictable. Here we have an interest in the everyday. And here again we have um, uh, the painting that was rejected because it was just too ordinary. And Gustave Courbet um, here, actually this is a huge painting. Um, I can't remember now, but it's actually like, I want to say it's like 12 feet long. So it's really, really, really big. And that was also a reason why it was rejected, because it's literally should not be this big. Paintings that were this big were supposed to be historical paintings. They were supposed to be of historical events, not ordinary people. So basically this was rejected for a variety of reasons, but that was one of them, because how, uh, how dare the artist create this painting of ordinary people at a funeral um, quite this big? It's just too big. And so that was another reason it was actually rejected. And I think that's actually as far as we're going to go today. Um, my baby's crying, so I have to go grab her. But um, thank you guys for listening. Let me know if you have questions, and I will look forward to talking to you soon.